All right, we have learned how to write and name ionic compounds. And in this video, we are going to learn how to write and name covalent compounds. Now here's something I want you to think about before we get started. Most of you probably know how to play Monopoly. Um, most of you probably know how to play the game Operation. You have two different games with each game having its own specific set of rules. Monopoly is not really hard. You just have to know the rules. Operation is not hard. You just have to know the rules. You can't play Monopoly with the rules from Operation. You can't play Operation with the rules from Monopoly. You've got to have the right set of rules with the right game. That's how we're going to approach ionic versus covalent. We're going to have two different sets of rules. Neither one are hard. It's just you've got to stay conscious of what you're working with. So once I've taught you covalent and then we start mixing things up, the first thing you're going to have to do is identify, hey, am I working with an ionic compound or am I working with a covalent compound? And then you simply apply the correct set of rules. Um, it's just keeping it straight. So just a reminder for you before we start covalent. Ionic compounds are metals and nonmetals. They might have a polyatomic ion in them. Usually it's at the end. It could be at the beginning if it's maybe ammonium, for example. All ionic compound names end with IDE, unless it has a polyatomic ion in it, and then you know we don't change the ending of a polyatomic ion, and we will never ever use prefixes in ionics. That might not mean much to you now because I haven't taught you covalent yet. Covalent compounds are nonmetals only. Everything in a covalent compound has to come from this part of the periodic table. You cannot have a metal in a covalent compound. There are no polyatomic ions in a covalent compound. And they all end with IDE. Now that's pretty convenient because now you can look at it like this. Ionics and covalents all end with IDE unless it's an ionic with a polyatomic ion in it. And covalent is where we're going to use prefixes. We're using prefixes in everything. So now that you've kind of seen the differences, you may want to go back later and make some notes on this particular um, page just because I think it's helpful to compare and contrast them. But you're going to have plenty more notes on covalent. So let's talk about covalent compounds. Again, covalents are nonmetals only. Sometimes these are referred to as molecular compounds. They all end with IDE. Now, this is just a real simple way to look at it, and we're going to look at examples from both ways. But if we give you the formula and ask for the name, your subscript becomes the prefix. For example, in N2O3, I can see I have two nitrogens and three oxygens. The prefix for two is di, and the prefix for three is tri. And I actually have a list of these on the next page of notes, so if you don't know these numerical prefixes, you can copy them then. Most of these you probably just know. That simply goes to the front of the word. So this is di nitrogen, notice I did not change the ending of that word, trioxide. Dinitrogen, trioxide, notice that it ends with IDE. The second word only ends with IDE. Likewise, if I give you the name and I ask for the formula, your prefix is just going to become the subscript, so it's actually really easy. It's just the opposite. So if I gave you tetraphosphorus decachloride, that's literally just saying, hey, you have got four phosphorus atoms and 10 chlorine atoms in that molecule. Write the elements in the same order that you see them in the name, P4Cl10. 
tetraphosphorus decachloride. That is literally it. There are just a couple little tiny things I'm gonna show you as we go through the examples, but honestly, it is that straightforward. Your challenge is gonna to be to not get these rules mixed up with the ionics. Now, real quickly, before we get into these, here is a um, list of your covalent prefixes. Mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, opta, nana, deca. And I doubt if that's new information for anyone, but you have those there if you need them and you will be able to make some notes on this page. Couple things I want you to keep in mind before we start, and I'll point these out as we go. We do not use mono with the first element. That's really the only weird thing I think you have to remember today. For example, most of you know that CO2 is carbon dioxide. Most of us would think it sounded a little weird if we called that monocarbon dioxide. So for the first element only, if there's only one, don't use mono. The other thing is sometimes when you put the prefix in front of the name of the element, the prefix is gonna end with a vowel, the element is gonna start with one, it's just gonna look kind of weird. And if you have an AO combination, like if you put hexa in front of oxygen, for example, you're gonna drop the A off of hexa. So an AO just turns into simply an O, and an OO turns into a, 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 an O. It's when you see it, again, it will just make sense. I honestly tell my students, don't get too upset or wrapped up by that. For beginning chemistry students, and this is beginning, if I can tell, hey, you've got the right prefix with the right element, I'm usually okay with that because this is something that just kind of comes with practice. And as you get better and better, you just know what looks right and what looks wrong. But that's a really good rule of thumb that we use in class. So for example, trisulfur, and instead of putting hepta oxide, it's just heptoxide. Sometimes people will even kind of still put that A in there to get the word out, but the A is actually dropped in the name. So just keep those things in mind, and we are going to get on this, and in just a couple minutes, really, you are going to be covalent naming beast. So let's start with the name and um, convert that into a formula. A good way to do this, in my opinion, would be to go ahead and just pause for a second and maybe write down the names of these First four, they're long. Um, boy, this sure makes you grateful for um, chemical formulas because nobody would want to write that out all the time. They kind of look like dinosaur names. Like they're, they're just really long. Some of them are tongue twisters. But write those down. And then when you're ready to move on, go back to play and we'll just go through these together. All right, so let's look at number one. Tetranitrogen octoxide. Tetra means four, oct is gonna be eight, you know that was octa. So basically what this name is telling me is you've got four nitrogens and eight oxygens. Those just became your subscripts. So N, four, O, eight. Is it that simple? Yes, it is really that simple. Now you just took a really scary looking name and you've written a very easy to look at formula. Let's look at number two. Diphosphorus pentabromide. Di means two, penta means five. The symbol for phosphorus is P. There are two of those. The symbol for bromide is BR. There are five of those and you are done. Isn't it great? I love this. Like I could literally just do these all day. We're not going to, but I could. Um, also, I think it's nice since these are your notes. Um, I kind of like these notations. 
especially if you're like a, a sophomore junior taking chemistry, because what if you go a year or two without it and then you find yourself in a college class needing it? Wouldn't it be nice to have these notes to be able to look back at and go, oh yeah, that's why I did that. We always think we'll remember things, even the easy stuff, and then sometimes we don't. So I encourage you to do it this way. You've got plenty of time right now. All right, let's look at number three. Notice I don't have a prefix in front of sulfur. That means there's one because we don't use mono with the first one. Hexa means six. So this means I have one sulfur and six iodides. SI6. And let's look at the last one. And I think four of these really are probably all you need. Dinitrogen tetrachloride. They are saying, hey, you've got two nitrogens, you've got four chlorines. I mean, I kind of feel like this is somebody sitting beside of you and giving you all the answers on the test. They're like literally telling you what it is. So N2Cl4, boom. How easy was that? Love it. So here's your little note. Remember, the prefix becomes the subscript. Now let's look at turning around and going the other way. This is not hard, it's just more writing. And um, that might not be as much fun, but it's still the same stuff. Now, um, just watch what I'm pointing to and listen to what comes out of my mouth. Di nitrogen trioxide. It's like dun 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 dun. And I know that's like really impressive technical, but literally that's all it is. Di nitrogen trioxide. The last word ends in IDE, the first word doesn't change. So let's write that down. Di nitrogen trioxide. Again, after you write that out, it sure makes you grateful for those chemical formulas. So really, these make your life easier, not harder. Okay, let's look at number two. Tetraphosphorus hexasulfide. <laughs> that was fun. Tetraphosphorus Wow, hexasulfide. Disclaimer, it's bound to happen. I'm probably gonna misspell something at some point because if I'm talking and writing at the same time, sometimes that goes downhill. Um, if you see it, feel free to call me out in the comments. Just be kind, I'm old. Okay, let's look at number three. Five is penta and eight is octa, so Penta carbon octabromide. Wow. Penta carbon octabromide. I bet you're just shaking your head saying I had no idea it was that easy. I would encourage you, if you haven't already done this, maybe on these last um, five, copy those down real quick and pause me, go through, try them, and then check them and see how you did. All right, let's look at four. I have one carbon and one oxygen. Now I've gotta remember my little exception. If the first one's one, I'm not gonna write mono. If the second one is one, you do write mono. So this is carbon, monoxide. And because we had M-O-N-O-O-X-I-D-E, remember those two O's, we just lose an O, so it's one, double O's become one O. So you definitely are not gonna do this. Which, I don't care who you are, that probably looks really weird, so. That's a no-no. Carbon monoxide. 
And on number five, we have one nitrogen and four bromines or bromides. So we're going to call that nitrogen. tetrabromide. So both of these were the, um, just the little reminders that we don't put mono with the first element. So this might be a great place to make that little note. Won't hurt you to write it down more than once. Don't put mono with first element. Pardon all that little shorthand there, just trying to cram it all in, you know, top it off with a nice, super scientific, puffy little cloud there to draw your attention to it later. And now six, seven, and eight. And I think on these three, um, I'm really just drawing your attention to the fact AOs and OOs turn into Os, just dropping the vowel off the end of the prefix. So number six is two carbons and four oxygens. So we would call this dicarbon tetraoxide. I can't say it without the A. I say tetraoxide, but we're dropping that A. Some of you may be more talented to, than me and can handle that. I, I throw the A in it when I say it. Dicarbon. T-E-T-R-O-X-I-D-E. -E. And, you know, as a first-year chemistry tutor, I'm not going to pop your hands if you put a, a little A in there. Again, I'm just interested. Are you getting this with this? But really, this is the right way to do it. So it is important. Let's look at number seven. Four phosphoruses and six oxygens. So this is tetraphosphorus. Hex, drop the A, oxide. Tetraphosphorus hexoxide. And the last one, tri-nitrogen non-oxide. And so these three were just drawing your attention that AO and OO are just O. And there you go. So what I want you to remember on these is that the subscript becomes the prefix. Everything ends in IDE. That is literally the entire covalent lesson. Um, I didn't see any point in breaking that up into two because it's super simple. The next lesson is going to take us back to ionics because we're going to start looking at those transition elements because they're really special, and then we're going to start mixing them up. Hope this was helpful. Make sure you practice your ionics. You practice your covalence. There's so many good websites out there. Practice them so that you're ready for us to add the next step.